Um, I hope you had a nice coffee and, and also welcome back to all the people who are joining us virtually as well. So we're in for a really, really interesting uh, hour now uh, looking at farming for water and how this will run is we'll have three presentations and then an opportunity to delve a bit deep into some of the um, issues raised, uh, very dependent on people with your engagement, sending in your questions, your queries and I would encourage you once again just to go onto Slido and, and enable that to happen from your end so that we can get as many any points to our uh, guests as possible. Um, a little nudge to maybe just check your phones are off, uh, put them onto silent, uh, and also if you are on social media, use hashtag source to tap 2022. I'm going to introduce the first three guests, so I'm not pop it, popping up and popping down, so we can focus and concentrate on their presentations. I'm um, delighted to say we have Mark Horton, All-Ireland Director of the Rivers, Rivers Trust, uh, with us this morning. Uh, we also have Dr. Rachel Cassidy at the end there from the Agri-Food and Bioscience uh, Institute, um, and also Dr. Catherine Glass, Senior Agricultural Economist in the Agri-Food and Biosciences Institute. And they will all be giving short presentations, and then we'll have a chance afterwards uh, for a Q&A. But first, uh, Farming for Water video for you to enjoy. Source to Tap's pilot land incentive scheme has helped farmers make changes to their agricultural practices designed to protect water quality in nearby rivers and lakes as well as make the farm business more sustainable. The scheme ran in the River Derg catchment for three years and offered farmers free guidance and 100% funding for any changes that needed to be made on their land or in their methods. The pilot land incentive scheme aimed to encourage farming practices that reduce the pressures on the freshwater environment as well as protecting the source of our drinking water. Support was given by project officers, who visited each farm to decide what alterations were needed. They looked for ways to reduce the amount of herbicide and dirty water leaving the farmer's land. The proposed changes were outlined in a personalised water and environment management plan, which specified what measures needed to be implemented. Aspects that were addressed included herbicide usage, storage and disposal, clean and dirty water separation, and excluding livestock from water courses. A farmer innovation option allowed landowners and project officers to come up with bespoke ways of dealing with a unique issue on a farm. So in the dirt catchment, as part of this pilot land incentive scheme, we have 119 farmers who have benefited um, from funding. So they've received funding and they've um, installed measures such as fencing, which will give them a long-term benefit to their farm. Um, and it does that because it keeps the cattle or the livestock out of the, out of the river. It stops the loss of, um, of soil and damage to their own farmland. And it stops the, the cattle having um, issues with lameness. And also um, in terms of herbicide application, it's saving the farmer um, money because they're using less, less herbicide in part of their land management practices. Lisa, how has Source to Tap collaborated with farmers to produce personalised water and environment management plans? So when we advertised the Source to Tap land incentive scheme, we invited farmers within the catchment to come along and register their interest um, in having a project officer um, come out and complete a farm visit on a farm. So we walked the farm with the farmer or the landowner and we um, identified maybe issues that they were concerned with on the farm, but also we had, um, identified um, issues near the water and how they were maybe managing the water on the farm. So after that we collected the information, we um, have an app where we collect a lot of the information and we were able to um, develop a water environment management plan. So this identified all the issues we met, we seen on the farm that day and we went back to the farmer and um, made suggestions of how we could improve um, some things on the farm and how we would um, give them financial support to do so. So Martin, tell us about what you've had done on your farm through the Source to Tap Land Incentive Scheme. Well, the first thing that took place was uh, the Source to Tap team came out and we walked the various fields. Basically, we have three parcels of ground and we walked all of that and they came up with a, a water treatment management plan for us. 
Um, there were three components to that, the three components being fencing, uh, weed wiping and uh, solar troughs. Uh, the field wiping was obvious, it was a, a rush, many rushes, and that was over a two year programme just to nuke them the first year and be sure to be sure the second year. And then the, the fencing, it was done to keep the stock out of the streams and mainly there was a fur river that runs through the path. And uh, we fenced it, but that led us to the problem then with no troughs because normally that's where the stock went for the water. So therefore the solar troughs were great because they've come into play now and so therefore it's super efficient. What has your experience been with the land incentive scheme? Very positive yeah. uh, from the outset really. The, at least in the team were great. Uh, we fully explained the situation. Uh, we were able to manage each individual bit that we wanted to implement bit by bit and so we weren't out all the money out front, we implemented a bit, we paid out the money, the money was refunded for the, from the, this grant scheme and then that enabled us to keep going. You know, obviously there's a cash flow situation to be managed but no, no, great and everything done nicely and time and promptly and definitely no complaints. So we are already starting to see the benefits to water quality uh, following the, the work that the farmers have done here in the Dirk catchment and it's fantastic to see. Um, the, the work as part of this pilot land incentive scheme was a big part of our project and it's all about reducing the loss of herbicide and soil to the water course and that makes such a difference in terms of the drinking water quality in the catchment. Well the involvement of the farmers and the changes they have made to their land management practice really does make a big difference because by reducing the herbicide and the soil loss at source in the catchment really does help us to reduce energy and treatment costs at the water treatment works downstream. So we're so grateful to the farmers for their involvement in the scheme and we hope that they're inspired to continue with this great work in the future and that others elsewhere are also inspired to do the same. For more detailed information about the Land Incentive Scheme, visit www.sourcetotap.eu. Um, so hopefully that's given you a flavour of um, the Land Incentive Scheme. Uh, and I'm just going to give you a brief overview of it now. Um, the only thing is I don't see my clicker to move the slides on, if there's anybody that can just have a wee look at that. But while we're just sorting that out, um, Sorry. it's okay, it's all right. <laughs> so um, just briefly, why, why did we pick the Derg catchment? So you've heard from Diane already that there were two river catchments that we were working in, the River Urn and the River Derg, and the River Urn's over four and a half thousand square kilometres. Uh, the River Derg is a more, mon more modest um, 480 square kilometres, and so it was a, a much easier area for us to work in. Thank you very much. There we go. Uh, that'll help a little bit to animate what I'm saying. Um, about half of the Dirk catchment has rushes growing in it. It's, it's poor, poorer agricultural land with lots of rushes. Uh, and because it's very wet peaty soils, that favours the rush growth. But because of the area of the catchment being um, about 480 square kilometres, it was a much more manageable area for us to deliver a pilot land incentive scheme in. And you'll hear shortly from uh, Rachel Cassidy about the monitoring program that took place. And right next door to the Derg, as, as if made perfectly for us, is the Finn catchment about the same size, same shape, uh, similar land uses. So it lent itself very well to a comparative study. Um, and of course, near the bottom of the Derg catchment, shown on the green cross, if you can just see it at the, at the bottom of the red area on the catchment there, is the Derg water treatment plant. And that's where we were trying to affect the water quality po positively, uh, so that we could improve uh, the raw water going into the treatment plant. Uh, and of course, uh, there's lots of other projects that have taken place all over uh, these islands looking at land management techniques. And we wanted to replicate some of the, the great things that have gone in, on in other uh, projects, working upstream of water treatment plants to affect the raw water that actually gets into the plant uh, at the end of the day. So how did the scheme work? Well, you heard briefly about that from Lisa uh, in the presentation, but just to kind of walk you through it. 
Um, landowners contacted us. We, we advertised the scheme widely, and landowners came to us asking for us to go and walk their farm with them. And that was very important because it was a joint approach from day one. Um, we don't pretend to know uh, about the farmer's business or what their aspirations are for the future. So it was very important to us to hear what they wanted to see happening on their farms and for us to share our, our knowledge and experience with them on what changes, what small changes we could possibly make on the farm, not just to make their farm more water friendly, but actually to make the farm more sustainable. So this was a win-win situation for everyone involved. That walkover survey resulted in a water environment management plan, which set out confidentially to the landowner what could be done on their farm, what the opportunities were. And that led to an application form to our land incentive scheme, where farmers could apply for up to 100% funding, or sorry, 100% funding for all of the measures uh, on their farm. The landowners then worked with their appointed contractors to do the work. Um, and supported by our project officers were able to oversee the work on their own farms. Uh, and then once that was done and the work had been paid for, they applied back to us for their reimbursement of their grant. And we were very quick at getting that money back to them. And we also allowed them to make multiple claims during the process to aid the cash flow, as you heard Martin Bogue speaking about uh, in the video there. But all along the way, our landowners were helped by our project officers, and that has been key to the success, I believe, of this, uh, this pilot land incentive scheme. So what did the land incentive scheme deliver? Well, uh, 234 um, farm surveys were undertaken and water environment management plans produced, and we invested 1.16 million euro, as you've already heard, in measures on farms. So that was direct investment on farms to improve water quality, and that money was spread over 118 farms uh, in the project area. And just after the, the next break, you'll be hearing from Nancy McGlinchey, who's here with us today, uh, and she'll be giving us her own personal uh, account of how she found the land incentive scheme. Um, but overall, uh, we uh, ended up being able to weed wipe over 146 acres of ground in the Derg catchment across 73 farms. And as you'll hear from Rachel shortly, that was actually just 3% of the catchment area. Um, we uh, installed 76 pesticide storage units. Uh, there were over 55 kilometers of livestock fencing. And then to support that, um, alternative drinking water sources, as you saw in, in the video. And also a number of clean and dirty water separation projects, which ensured that farm water was managed in a more sustainable way, sending the dirty water to where it needed to be collected and sending the clean water away to um, streams and, and nearby rivers so that um, the storage of dirty water could be maximized on the farms. And then I think what was a very exciting part of our land incentive scheme was the farmer innovation option. So again, we cannot think that we know or can prescribe all the answers to all the problems that we might see on a farm. It's very important that we give farmers the opportunity to come up with some solutions themselves. And so through the farmer innovation option, we were able to design bespoke measures on farms with the landowners uh, to tackle particular issues relating to water protection. And this graph here at the bottom, if you can make it out, uh, shows the blue columns, which were the, 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 the percentage of application forms that contained certain items within the land incentive scheme. And by far and away, uh, the largest number of applications included fencing, followed by pesticide stores and weed wiping. And of course, the uh, water troughs, which are required to provide the alternative drinking water sources. But interestingly, if you look at the green columns, apart from fencing, which we all know is an expensive option anyway, it's not cheap to fence. Actually, the, um, the measures around weed wiping, around pesticide storage, which helped to reduce the MCPA in the river, were relatively low cost measures. So what you can actually see is that sometimes low cost solutions can actually provide enormous benefits to the water quality and to the wider economy. So just very briefly, what were the successes of the land incentive scheme? Well, we have affected water quality, I'm glad to say, in a positive way, and Rachel will explain more about that shortly. 
Certainly, the fact that our land incentive scheme was advisor-led meant that there was a relationship and long-term trust built up between our project and landowners with open discussions between both about how we could maximise the impacts of this project, not just for water quality, but also for the farming community in the Derg as well. And that trust has grown into meaningful relationships where honest discussions have happened in the farmyard and along the river uh, about what can be done to protect our water quality collectively. The, offer, the solutions that we offered through the Land Incentive Scheme provided win-win solutions, not just for water quality, but also for the farm businesses, bringing about savings, uh, efficiencies, and better ways of working on the farm. We offered a staged claims option within the scheme, which allowed farmers to uh, maintain control of their cash flow on the farm and enabled them perhaps to do far more act activities on the ground because we were allowing them to um, stagger their claims bring in cash and then invest more money uh, into uh, further measures on the farm. Uh, the fast reimbursement also helped with this, but also the opportunity to exchange knowledge and expertise, uh, farmer to farmer and project to farmer was incredibly valuable and a lot was learned not just by uh, the farming community, but also by the source to tap project by the farmers who manage the land uh, in the dirt catchment. And what were the challenges? There, of course, there were challenges. Um, it took time to get our land incentive scheme established. Um, we were an unknown entity in the catchment when we arrived. No one had heard of the Source to Tap project. They maybe hadn't heard of the partners that were involved in it. And so it took time to build trust. And I think if anyone was thinking of delivering a scheme like this in the future, that time needs to be built into a project. Um, also, promoting the scheme proved difficult sometimes. Um, social media wasn't the best option for us. It's not used um, very much within the farming community. Um, more likely to read the newspaper or hear the radio or word of mouth was a very important uh, mode of communication for us. And also we were um, up against it in terms of weather and seasonality with some of the measures that we implemented on the ground. During our project, we encountered the wettest year on record uh, in the River Derg catchment, which held us up and the landowners up significantly. And of course, these things need to be factored into the thinking of future projects. Without going on too much longer about the last three, um, there was a lot of procurement and administration around our scheme simply because of the funding that we were using. Some of these um, uh, uh, kind of uh, procurement and administration rules had to be passed on to the landowners. We were able to support them through that process, but it maybe did put some people off from getting involved in the land incentive scheme. And of course, maybe unique to this last few years, uh, Brexit and COVID presented their own significant challenges, which we had to battle through. But thankfully, as a project partnership and as a community, uh, alongside the farmers, we were able to overcome these challenges. So finally, what are the learnings from the land incentive scheme that are most significant? Well, I think the fact that we had advisors on hand all of the time to support our landowners was key to, to the success of this pilot land incentive scheme. And those advisors were in non-regulatory organizations. So it enabled honest and open conversations between landowners and the project in order to tackle the issues that were seen on the ground. Our flexibility in the implementation of our scheme was important. We listened to the concerns of landowners and how the scheme could be better managed. And I think in future schemes, there needs to be flexibility around the, the measures that can be implemented on farms and how they're implemented. And having a farmer innovation option allowed us to go above and beyond the prescribed measures that we had in our scheme to bring about greater water quality benefits than we would have otherwise achieved if we'd have just had a prescription of measures to choose from. So in future, if there are any key learnings from the land incentive scheme, it is this for future agri-environmental schemes. Uh, make them attractive to landowners, make them easily accessible, and of course, provide ongoing support through non-regulatory farm advisors. Thank you very much. Okay. <clears throat> well, you've heard there how the land incentive scheme was um, designed and rolled out in the catchment with the participation of the farmers. Um, to go with that, it fell to ourselves and AFPE and Ulster University to come up with a monitoring programme that would allow us to collect robust data to assess the impact of the land incentive scheme on, on water quality, the proof, the evidence provision. 
Um, and that's what we've done. Uh, we designed a monitoring program that was appropriate both to the, the system, which is a highly dynamic large river system of 384 square kilometres, and the contaminants, colour, turbidity, and MCPA herbicide. Um, so I suppose our main considerations in designing that monitoring program were in terms of the frequency of, of measurement. We know from other work on, on nutrients that in these systems, uh, a large proportion of annual load can move in a few hours. So we needed a monitoring frequency that was in line with that. We also needed um, to deal with the high, as Mark said, variability interannually in terms of rainfall and uh, weather. And, and that really, you, you can't do that by monitoring just one catchment. So we um, deployed a, a before, after control and impact <coughs> design where the Finn River to the north of the Derg, which is almost out the same area, same land use, hydrologically almost identical, but wouldn't have any implementation of measures and it would act as a control for the period. And with that, we were able to uh, isolate the effects of the land incentive scheme from anything associated with, with weather or, 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 or change uh, like that. Um, so turbidity and colour were relatively easy to monitor. Um, you can use optical sensors, you can have measurements every minute if you like. We had our own uh, sensors, but also NI Water at the Water Treatment Works have in situ continuous monitoring of these parameters. MCPA was more difficult um, because it's a complex chemical. The acid herbicides need laboratory analysis through um, gas, uh, mass spectrometry. Um, and because of that, we had to install kiosks at the outlets of both catchments, put in automatic refrigerated samplers, and then collect the samples and take them back in the lab. And that has gone on now for four years. Um, so what we've got, I suppose, as, as one of our main outputs from, from the project is this unique data set of herbicide loss in a temperate uh, climate and from a grass-based agriculture. There is nothing like our this data set anywhere else. Um, and it's a unique resource for, for research. It's also given us a really clear, much clearer insight into how MCPA is lost and how it moves in the landscape. For example, you can see the time series on the, the bottom of the graph there. You can see how discharges the gray uh, peaks when, the, when there's a storm event, you get an increase in concentration. We've been able to identify that over 70% of MCPA losses occur during storm events. Small and large rainfall events, it doesn't really matter if there's MCPA present and available to be washed off. And with that, we've identified that you could use a combination of soil moisture conditions and uh, water levels live from a river to maybe at the water treatment works uh, trigger abstraction pauses to reduce the pressure on the filter system uh, during those, those peaks. We've also um, got evidence now of the persistence of MCPA in the system. <clears throat> we had no idea of this before we, we started. And when you log the graph on the y-axis, you can see that true winter MCPA in both the Derg in blue and Finn in orange never goes away. There is always, since we've started monitoring for four years now, MCPA in the system. So that was another uh, major finding. Um, and of course, the evaluation of impact is, our, our, is, is what we, we set out to do. So we, we've set the, the date for the implementation of weed wiping as a, a main measure to uh, impact MCPA as April 2020. And we monitored before and after that period and compared the Derg and the Finn uh, for that. So in terms of changes in concentration were what we looked at first. We've compared equal 18 month periods before the scheme and after. We've looked at flow weighted concentrations which account for the load moving through the system and neutralize for comparison between the two rivers. Uh, we also look at time-weighted concentrations, and these are, are, I suppose, reflect what the water treatment work would be experiencing at the end of the pipe abstracting at a constant rate. And when we've done that, and accounting for the differences in the fin control, which also changed over the period, we've seen a 24% reduction in MCPA concentrations in a time-weighted average, and a 21% reduction in dirt concentrations on a flow-weighted average. And that 
is it, you know, one of the key findings coming out of, of the work to date. The greatest changes in concentration are happening at the higher ranges, so during storm events. Through the reduction in, in the source, the MCPA is, is, not, has, is not there uh, in as great a, a quantity, and, and, and in the removal of those source pressures, you're getting a, a reduction in the storm event peaks. However, we have not seen a proportional reduction in the, in the number of samples that exceed the 0.1 microgram per litre threshold that we uh, would, would use as a metric for, for treatment need at the water treatment works. So there's a, a treatment need remains. Um, in terms of loads over the period, as Mark said, we had a lot of in, interannual variation in rainfall. Um, but what we do have is the first year um, in 2018 uh, had almost identical flow uh, conditions and uh, rainfall as the last year, 2021. So those two highlighted there are almost identical, so a good comparison. If you look at the peak in, 20, in the cumulative load in 2018, um, between April and November, it was almost 47 kilos of MCPA came down the Finn and the Derg uh, were, were almost the same. But in 2021, when you compare it, um, the, the Derg load is 59% is, is, is that of the Finn. So it's a very significant reduction. Um, when I add on, I suppose, the estimated weed wiped area as a cumulative uh, graph uh, on the right of that, um, which is it's really an estimate of uh, the total area weed wiped at any period to the end of the project. You can see that there's a, probably a cumulative effect towards the what response we see in 2021. And that's about nine square kilometres that was uh, treated by the end, which is a very um, small proportion. It's 2.4% of the total catchment. And that impact uh, that we're seeing is, is, is down to that. And it, I suppose it stands for the, you know, the importance of targeted measures that the project officers went out, went to specific farms and identified the best places for weed wiping within the catchment. Um, we've also looked at turbidity and colour. Um, these may take longer to, to show effects, particularly colour, where a large part of the upland catchment is peat. But turbidity, the measures associated with riparian fencing, uh, with uh, keeping cattle out of rivers, um, should have an impact. And we are seeing that um, for the 50th percentile, which is the median turbidities pre and post the implementation of the land incentive scheme, we are now seeing uh, a decline um, in turbidity levels in, in the Derg as a, as a result we, uh, of the, the land uh, incentive scheme works. And that's work that Kevin Atchison and, and Phil ha, have been um, continuing with as part of Kevin's PhD. So overall, our key findings are that the land incentive scheme has a, a positive and quantifiable impact on uh, MCPA and turbidity levels in the catchment. Um, we're seeing significant reductions in MCPA concentrations um, with a, you know, a fairly limited investment in terms of weed wiping. Um, I suppose 2.4% of the catchment. Uh, for water treatment, um, the reduction in high concentrations does take some pressure off the filtration system, but um, the durations of high risk uh, periods remains unchanged. Um, there's no indication of pollution swapping associated with glyphosate. We've monitored pre and post uh, for glyphosate as, as well in both catchments, and there's no significant difference between the Derg and Finn in terms of that. Um, and turbidity, the positive decline in turbidity and impacts may increase as vegetation re recolonizes riverbanks and, and stabilizes going forward. Um, we are continuing uh, the monitoring work. We've received funding from DAFM and from DERA to, to keep the Finn and the DEREG monitoring program going. And we're also, um, as, as part of the work Cathy's involved in, going to look at, at how uh, participation in the scheme has affected um, behavioural change. Um, so I'll, I'll hand over to Cathy now, who will show how the results have been translated into the, the cost-benefit analysis.
So basically, the, the talk I'm going to give today is really to look at the cost-benefit analysis that we conducted as part of, of the project. My, my colleague and I, Diane Burgess, are the economists on the project. So basically, the question that we're going to ask is this. Does the economics of catchment management stack up? So several benefits that we can clearly see from the project. Um, cleaner raw water for drinking water abstraction, educational and recreational benefits, erosion and flood control, and also enhanced biodiversity and carbon benefits. But for our study, it was, it was beyond the, the scope of the work to place a monetary value on all of these benefits. So we've decided that we decided that we were going to focus on the main benefit of the land incentive scheme which was a focus on the, on the drinking water quality improvements that will translate into water treatment cost savings. So, sorry, I'm going to go back a slide here. So th there are three, um, there are savings basically from reductions in MCPA, um, in colour and turbidity. And the, these will produce um, cost savings in capital in terms of reduced um, regeneration and replacement of the GAC filters used to remove MCPA. There's also operational cost savings from, from um, less chemicals being used and less sludge being produced because the colour and turbidity levels are, are reduced. And there's also significant exceedance prevention savings, which we'll um, look at in just in a moment. And these, these can be quite substantial. So um, in recent years, there have been exceedances at the Derg Water Treatment Works in both MCPA and also in disinfectant byproducts, also called THMs. So we have very, very stringent um, water, drinking water quality regulations in, in Ireland and, and Northern Ireland. To, just to put this into perspective, our um, drinking water limit for MCPA is, is 0.1 micrograms per litre. And that compares to 700 micrograms per litre in the United States. So very stringent drinking water um, regulations. So in order to tackle these exceedances, it, it just led to an escalation of, of costs. So from upgrades to more expensive um, carbon filters, the GACs, to costly trials on site, feasibility, treatability studies, optioneering studies, to really try to you know, tackle these issues. And then culminating in the design and construction of capital works solutions. So you can see just in the picture there, um, there's a, an eight million pound clarifier being constructed at the moment at Derg Water Treatment Works to, to make sure that um, the compliance in THMs is, is achieved. And there's also a pow powdered activated carbon facility at the cost of, of 4.4 4 million being constructed at the moment to deal with MCPA um, exceedances. And of course, there are ongoing operational costs associated with these, with these capital works solutions. So in order to, look, to, to value the benefits, we looked at two scenarios, the business as usual scenario and the intervention scenario. So under business as usual, there's no land incentive scheme implemented. And in order to tackle the THM exceedances to ensure compliance, the, the clarifier um, is constructed. Um, we, also, we also assume then, of course, to deal with the MCPA exceedances, that the powdered activated carbon facility um, goes ahead. Uh, um, and that's, that's happening at the moment. Um, it's also assumed that there's no LIS investment um, going forward over just the period of our analysis up to 2048. So in terms of the intervention scenario, we're assuming that the LIS is implemented under source to tap, which was um, finished off um, last year. And to date, we don't have sufficient evidence to, to show that um, THM exceedances could be brought under control through catchment measures because we just don't have the evidence to show that the colour concentrations have been brought down enough as yet. Um, however, we do have evidence that the, uh, the, the MCPA exceedances and the, the, you know, that the compliance could be, could be achieved with catchment measures. 
as you saw from Rachel's presentation, there's been a very encouraging 21 to 24 percent reduction in MCPA concentrations. And, and that's in a very short space of time in which the, um, the land incentive scheme operated. And we also carried out a, a process evaluation which enabled us to really look at issues and barriers that would need to be addressed going forward. And we also looked at um, successful schemes run elsewhere just to look at evidence from them, such as the, the Pest Smart um, program and Slug It Out as well. So, but, but basically, the, the conclusion that we came to is, is really that long-term investment would be needed um, in order to, to get the MCPA exceedances down. So just what would this additional LIS investment look like going forward? Well, of course, you'd need the support for farmers to minimize MCPA use through um, subsidized weed wiping with, with glyphosate through free weed wiping hire to enable a, a try before you buy, and also weed wiper grants to replace the, um, the boom sprayers that are very common in the catchment for, say, for spraying MCPA. And you can see one of those in, in the picture there. Um, another issue really is that farmers weren't really aware that there was an MCPA problem in the catchment. So it's really important for them to, to be able to receive um, regular and simple and you know, up-to-date information on raw wa water quality, just so, so people w will know where we're at with raw water quality in the catchment. And this is very much in line with Article 7.3 of, of the Water Framework Directive, which promotes a, a very um, prevention-led approach, which puts the focus on raw water enhancement. So if we're to comply with this regulation, that's what we need to do. And, and, and this is it's, it's positive as well because it ensures that the responsibility for clean water doesn't rest just with water companies, but with all stakeholders in the catchment. The additional investment would also mean that pesticide storage units would be supplied to those who haven't received them on the scheme. And also um, that regular pesticide disposal schemes would be delivered just in order to clear out unwanted pesticides, uh, including um, MCPA. So that's basically what we would be um, suggesting um, going forward. So in terms of our results, so basically we took the main benefit of the land incentive scheme, and remember this is excluding all the other benefits that we discussed earlier. So the main benefit, which was water treatment savings costs, and then we compared this to the cost of the LIS and projected it forward. Um, so it's including future um, additional investment. So we found that there was a net present value of 8.7 million. So that's present value benefits minus present value costs. So that, that gave us a benefit cost ratio of 3.36. So for every pound invested would, would yield three pounds and 36 pence in water quality improvements and water quality benefits. Now, the majority of the cost savings are achieved because regulatory breaches in MCPA trigger a large um, you know, capital and operational costs that could be avoided with effective capital, um, effective catchment management. So just a few takeaways. So for every pound invested, there's going to be over three pounds in water quality benefits. Now, the, the provision of, of good quality raw data on water quality just is, is very important because it just highlights the, 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 the fact that the responsibility for clean water is, is a responsibility of all um, stakeholders in the catchment. And one of the very clear benefits that I saw is, is, is the partnership side of things, the partnership and the stakeholder network building that comes out of these projects that's really at the right at the heart of catchment management, that they can be used to drive you know, wider goals as well, such as um, net zero and reversing biodiversity loss, for which the, the, the cooperation of the farming community is, is absolutely essential. So, but, but catchment management, as we'll say over and over again, it takes a lot of time. It takes time to build up trust with the farmers, to change mindsets, to change behavior, to, 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 to secure their buy-in. But, but in return, you know, there, there's, there's potential for, for strong savings in water treatment 
and, and also the, um, the benefit of, of additional um, ecosystem services as well. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Um, thank you all so much. I'm just mindful of the time, everyone. I don't, I'm never one to say no to coffee, but I'm just wondering, should we uh, crack on? It's five past 12. We're due to have a coffee break at 10 past 12. Um, so we could just keep going until lunch. Rebecca, does that sound okay with you? Or just have a, a short break, maybe, if, if that's okay with you. We'll keep it as short as we can. So um, we're going to have a, a quick chat now. Uh, forgive me while I just bring these chairs up. If I could ask you both to come over. Um, And obviously, ladies and gentlemen, if there are questions from the audience, you can just wave at me. You don't need to go to Slido. Slido, Slido. Um, and we can uh, also take questions from the virtual audience through Slido as well. Thank you very much. Um, Mark, uh, you know, it was very interesting to hear uh, your talk. I just wonder, you know, what do you think some of the things you, you were able to do in this worst to tap project that could not be done um, in, in a more, I suppose, under a more regulatory scheme? Yeah, I think um, one, of, one of the key successes, as I've said before, is having an advisor-led scheme. Uh, so we were able to have conversations with landowners about what would work well on their farm. Um, I think with a lot of the current agro-environmental schemes, there's an onus on the landowner to decide what measures they want to implement, where they want to put them. Uh, and that doesn't necessarily bring about not only the greatest benefit to water quality, but also the greatest benefit to the farm business itself. So by having um, a discussion uh, with the landowner, we were able to listen to how the farm business works, um, what the aspirations were of, of the landowner, and also bring then to bear our knowledge about how the river was reacting to MCPA, uh, colour and turbidity, and, and where we could potentially plate, place key measures on the farm to bring about the greatest benefit. And you, you mentioned the term confidential. I mean, mm -hmm. how important is that uh, yeah. in the field, on the ground, if you like? Uh, it's incredibly, incredibly important. Uh, so uh, I think there is a, a fear amongst the farming community to open up about the problems that they're experiencing, even if they do want to talk to someone about it, uh, because they fear that they'll get into trouble for admitting that there's maybe something not going well on the farm or potentially impacting on the water or air or soil environment. Uh, so by having confidentiality, it ensures that we have those honest and open conversations uh, that allows us to, to maximise our impact on protecting the water quality, but also as well allowing landowners to explore different options that may not have come to them naturally, uh, bringing new ideas and also allowing landowners to bring new ideas to us so that we could facilitate that through the land incentive scheme. Is it your sense that the fear is from you know, regulation and enforcement, or is the fear potentially the peers, the farmers around them, that, that farm, you know, where yeah. is the fear? I think it comes from all directions. Uh, I think there's a, there's a fear of, of um, prosecution, I suppose, from a regulatory authority if they admit there's something going wrong. Uh, but everybody, every farmer wants all the farmers to know that their farm business is doing well and that there's nothing wrong on the farm. So that those dis discussions don't happen naturally, I suppose, uh, amongst the farming community. So I think, you know, having a sounding board uh, and that's really, I suppose, what the project and certainly the project officers were to the farming community. We were able to bounce ideas off each other. And, and a key thing about that, and I said it earlier on, is that we all need to learn. We all need to be switched on to listening. We shouldn't be transmitting our ideas and not listening to, it, to, to, to everyone else. So listening to what farmers have to say, farmers listening to what we have to say, and then agreeing a common way, a common ground, a common way forward that would benefit everyone. And, and finally, I mean, you, you did mention that, you know, reaching out on social media isn't the best way, that, you know, and that's completely understandable. One thing I know from other projects, uh, particularly in Mayo and Galway, has been actually that farmers have been quite keen on WhatsApp groups. Mm -hmm. and that yeah. Within that realm, you can get an awful lot of data sharing happening, yeah. uh, you know, good community building across the board, and yes. also a sense, I suppose, of competition in a fun way yes. uh, yeah. to, to do the right thing by the land. So I don't, I don't think there's any right or wrong answer to the, the way you communicate. You need to explore how people communicate in the particular area you're working in. 
Um, so in the Derg catchment, uh, there is a more elderly farming population. Uh, they tend to have a mobile phone that you could dri drive over. Uh, it's maybe not necessarily a smartphone. It's because they're sensible. Uh, so <laughs> you know, you could drop it down the drain and it'll still be okay. Um, so, you know, it's the traditional media that worked well for us, getting the radio adverts out there because they're listening to it while they're out on the tractor or driving the road or reading the farming press. It might be in another catchment that, as you say, social media works really well. Um, so, uh, you know, key to the success of any project is to understand where your audience is going to encounter your message and then to, to, to capitalise on that. Uh, Rachel, I, I, I must say the persistence issue of MCPA was quite a surprise to me. Um, you know, the research coming out about that, and as you say, it's such an interesting piece of research, not only for this part of the world, but, you know, across the board, and, and certainly I'm, I'm mindful of a lot of farmers in the west of Ireland who use MCPA to control uh, rushes as well. Um, I mean, what can we take from that? You know, I mean, what can be done about that? Well, I mean, I think, is it on? It is on, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, well, uh, I mean, it persists, it's at low levels, but uh, I mean, I suppose the thing about MCPA is that it's highly mobile and easily washed off the plant. Yeah. Um, but for degradation, it depends on oxygen and um, light and, and, and temperature. So once it moves into the, the soil zone, and if that soil is poorly drained, then it can hang around for, for quite a long time. And it's something we need to do research on. I suppose the areas that are saturated year round within the catchment would be a particular focus um, if they are holding MCPA through winter and then releasing it. Um, and I suppose I was heartened by the, the minister's statement there that the, you know, on land eligibility and that areas of rush, you know, going forward may not, I mean, I think a focus for a lot of farmers in those upland extensive areas was to clear rushes to make sure that they were eligible for payment. So you, at the source, you stop the need to use MCPA? I think that would help. And with persistence, I think it's that. We, we, I mean, we've still a lot of research to do, but it's holding it, you know, reducing the potential for it, it being in reserve in those very wet areas that maybe aren't agriculturally productive anyway. So I, th I think that that would, that would help. Um, Catherine, we've had a question here. Do you think that farmers in the catchment now understand why MCPA is, is, is found in raw, uh, that's found in the water that is an issue? I mean, you, you express some... I suppose I, I wouldn't like to say surprise, but you certainly put importance on the fact that that data needs to get to farmers. They need to know about the data associated with the water in their area. Yeah, ab absolutely. I, I think it's very important to get that message out there, uh, you know, about the raw water, because I think too often, you know, the, the, the everything's left up to the to the water company, and the water company has to deal with water issues. But I think, you know, especially, you know, as, as we look more to to kind of reaping the rewards of ecosystem services. We're really trying to, I suppose, get the message out there that it is a responsibility of all people to, you know, all um, stakeholders in the catchment to do their bit. So, so I think if, if, there were, if there were regular updates, you know, information bulletins that, that you know, gave people, you know, information, you know, um, on, on raw water quality and they could see the improvement, you know. So, you know, really what we'd want to get to is the point at which you know, the raw water quality is 0 0.1 microgram. You know, it, it's, it's beating that limit ever before it gets to the treatment works. So it's kind of working together and just, you know, making farmers more aware of issues and, you know, storing pesticides um, safely and, you know, not overusing pesticides. And, you know, so there's the whole education side of things. It's, it's really important to get that message out there. Mark, one of the questions here, and in fact, you know, I, I, I wondered it myself, was what types of farmer innovation projects were adopted? So you had this, you know, these various um, projects they could subscribe to, but also this, this other area, which is like blue sky thinking, you know, what they brought to you. Can you give a few examples of what they did? Yeah, so um, there were extensive areas of the catchment, particularly in the upland areas where you had... Um, large swathes of open peaty land that was being farmed, uh, kind of sheep hill farming. Uh, and uh, there's lots of drains that cut through that landscape um, and it wouldn't have been feasible to have fenced off every one of those drains. Uh, but you could see on the ground, you know, sheep were trailing through those ditches and causing massive amounts of erosion. 
Uh, so uh, one of the innovation projects was to actually build wee bridges for the sheep. Sounds quite cute, I know. Um, but uh, if, you, if you build a little wooden bridge across the drain, the sheep are more likely to use it than they are to clamber up and down the ditch. Uh, so they, this particular farm I'm thinking of was peppered with these little wooden bridges, uh, and the sheep have successfully used those, which has cut down the amount of erosion. And you can see where the vegetation has started to recolonize the banks of, of those ditches. So the land remains in agricultural production, but there's less pressure on that land. So I think that, that's probably one example of, of, of a, f a few things that were done on farms where it wasn't something we thought up and wrote into our scheme, it was in discussion with the landowner that that idea came up to, to, to bring about that solution. And just briefly, I suppose, you know, assessing whether they would be something that you would take on board or not, is that just a judgment call yourself? Yeah, so um, again, going back to the rules of the scheme, we were not allowed to fund anything that would bring about an economic advantage to one farmer over another that hadn't accessed the scheme. So there was some consideration about what could or could not be funded under the farmer innovation option. Uh, but I'm glad to say, actually, that all the ideas that were put forward were eligible for funding. And, you know, I think it highlights the fact that landowners, when they're given the opportunity to discuss what's going on on their farm, they know what the answer is. They just need someone to help them realise it on the ground, a little bit of support, and a lot can be achieved from that. And, and, and you know, stating the obvious, every field is different, let alone every farm, and there's no one who knows the fields better than the farmer themselves. Um, Catherine, a quick question here came in. Was the cost of the one-to-one -one support included in the cost-benefit analysis? Yes. yes. Yes, it was. That, that's yes. right, yes, it was. Yeah. Um, we, we just have you know basic figures to you know to begin with that we worked with with um, Roy Taylor um, in NI Water. A few of us are, have, have got together to discuss this, and obviously there's more cost savings over time. And it's important to remember as well that you know the, the benefits of weed wiping are, are cumulative. So as you as you eliminate more and more rushes around the catchment, um, you know the, the costs will will fall off. And as as the MCPA. Is, is is eliminated as well. Those peaks are knocked off. So 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 that all feeds into it as well. But yes, we've we've included all those costs going forward as well. Um, just mindful of time, so we're going to fly through a few more questions and then wrap up. Uh, Rachel, the reduction of 24%, very encouraging. No doubt needs to also be a lot higher as well into the future. How do you get those bigger reductions? Um, <coughs> well, I mean, you, you saw the area that was weed wiped. Was, was fairly small. Um, there's definitely room for improvement there. And I think this is something that will build. We're only, I mean, we were, we, we, we continued for two years from the start of the, the weed wiping being brought in. We need to give that information back now to farmers. I think it's, it's a cycle, really. If, if we can show them the impact that actions have had, it'll encourage them, I'd hope, to continue that work. Um, and, and, you know, I suppose just go go like that, and and we we need to. I mean, in the derg, we need to look going forward at how the weed wiping would be delivered. It was delivered by contractors in this case. What happens now? That stopped for farmers and make it maybe accessible to them again. Mm -hmm. So, and, and a quick question on on the issue, which is, would rush spraying continue if all land became eligible for support to payments? As uh, I mean, it's, it's a hard thing to answer, I'm sure, but what would be your guess? Yeah, I, well, I know personally from, from our farm that there is there are areas that are being treated and, and cut that really we don't use for um, farm profitable farming that we could just let go. Mm -hmm. So I think there will definitely be a proportion of that extensive land um, in the upper part of the catchment that, that will... Uh, would I mean be removed from MCPA treatment if it was no longer the pressure on farmers to um, to, to 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 get rid of rushes? I suppose the other thing we need to look at is an improved grassland where farmers are using MCPA um, to tackle rush within silage fields. That's a much more challenging um, thing to address. Um, so, and I presume your research. I mean, you said that you've been funding has been granted to continue the research. One imagines that it will inform policy about the use of MCPA in the future. Yeah, we are um, we're continuing at the moment. It's a, a DERA funded project with support from DAFM to continue the fund. So we will monitor both those catchments for the next few years, see what the uh, you know the legacy of the the project has been, and, and undertake behavioural change work. And, I mean, it gives us scope to do more 
focus and investigations on specific aspects of the research. So, um, I feel like we could talk for another half an hour, but we're going to have to to wrap up. Uh, Mark, finally, just to end with you, uh, of all the things that you learned from this, you know, was there anything that was particularly surprising? Gosh. <laughs> um, Given your own experience, you know, working with water, you know, anything that uh, sticks out in your mind? I don't, I don't think it's surprising, but maybe something that I would like to highlight is that there are very few farmers who actually want to see waterways polluted. <laughs> you know, this is, this is something we have to remember, that, you know, landowners are working ex incredibly hard uh, every day to try and make their farm business profitable but also within all the rules and regulations of farming. And I think uh, there is a constant struggle on a daily basis to understand all the things that are being asked of them. Uh, and by simply having someone who can be trusted, who they can pick up the phone to and just run something by is a relief for them. And we have heard that time and time again from landowners how much they've benefited from just having somebody's phone number in their phone that they can call up when they want to. And we have been available to them all the time, <laughs> let me add, you know, weekends, evenings. Um, but that, those discussions, those, re those relationships that have been built are incredibly important. And I think that's probably what's missing from a lot of the work that goes on is, is the ability to be able to build relationships, build trust and have that community of knowledge and expertise in an area um, that's accessible to everyone. It seems like, like so many of these projects that I've come across that the most astonishing byproduct of all of, it, all of it is exactly what you say, which is the rebuilding of communities in many ways and the rebuilding of connections between people in a very positive way. Absolutely. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to take a very short break, if we can, and be back here in, I dare say, six to seven minutes. But please thank Mark, uh, Rachel and Catherine. Thank you very much.